Academy of Ideas. Um, and obviously with this topic tonight from furlough to masks, um, can we ever return to normal? There's obviously a vast amount of ground for us to cover. Uh, we won't be able to offer you, I think, any sort of clear answers just yet, but we are starting something that is very sorely needed, I think, um, which is a genuine public conversation about the what is going to be the way forward. Um, everything at the moment, it seems to me, is rather patchy. Uh, the city centres are somewhat deserted, but things are getting a little bit busier. But suburbs, it seems, are quite busy. Um, the shops are open and getting a bit busier, but there's queues and there's masks. Um, there's progress on a possible vaccine, but at the same time, lots of talk about the fact that we'll be uh, sort of facing another wave of things maybe in the winter. Um, and at the heart of this, I think, is this strange phrase, uh, the new normal, which obviously by itself puts a question mark uh, next to uh, whether and indeed whether we, whether we want to and indeed whether we can um, return to normal, which was the normal of pre-pandemic life. Um, so for some, it's been a time characterized by more time with their family, uh, saving money, not commuting, um, and the comfort for some people of the government's furlough scheme. Whereas for others, there's a sort of loss of sociability, um, impending job losses, and generally speaking, life being put on hold. So tonight we'll try and uh, get to grips with what the new normal is um, and how, or indeed whether we want to, get back to the old normal. Um, obviously, as part of the Academy of Ideas, we have a commitment to trying to at least keep the old normal of public debate and public discussion alive as much as we can. And so we've been putting on various uh, events uh, and all via Zoom throughout the lockdown period, uh, which hopefully some of you have already been to. Um, but so, and as part of that, we haven't taken up the further, we haven't been further, we've been out there trying to keep the public sphere alive. So I do have to ask that if you can help support us during this time, obviously we'd very much appreciate that. Uh, you may well, uh, I can't, I used to say when we were holding these, when the pubs were closed, it would be like, well, you'd go to the pub and you'd have a pint, so chuck us the price of a pint. But um, still, uh, I can still ask if you can head to academyofideas.org.uk slash donate and uh, donate whatever you feel able to. If you can, that would really help us and, uh, make up for some of the, the lost ground that we're all in the difficult times that we're, we're feeling. Um, not here to listen to me, obviously, so I wanna get through to the speakers as uh, quickly as possible. So I will just uh, introduce them briefly in the order that they're going to speak. And um, we've got a really great panel lined up today to start this public conversation, and I'm, I'm really glad to be able to introduce them. So speaking first will be uh, Ben Habib, who's the founder and CEO of First Property Group, He's the chairman of Brexit Watch, an organizer at Unlocked and known to many of you probably for being a former Brexit party MEP. Um, so a big welcome to Ben. Speaking next will be Rebecca Lowe, who's an investment company research director. She's the former director of Freer and the co-founder of a group called a Radical, um, and very much a sort of thinker on issues of, of freedom and libertarianism. So we're really delighted to be joined by Rebecca. Speaking third will be Dr. Claire Gerarda, who's the medical director at NHS Practitioner Health uh, Programme and the former chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners. Then speaking fourth, uh, we're delighted to be joined by Anne Elizabeth Moutet, who's a columnist at The Telegraph, the vice president of the Institute Jean-Jacques Rousseau um, in Paris and a commentator, regular commentator in, on French TV and across French media. So we're delighted to be joined by her. And then lastly, but by no means least, we'll be joined by Norman Lewis, who's the technology and innovation consultant and a former director at PwC. Uh, our speakers will offer some short five minute introductions. I'll be as rigid as I can be uh, with the time. And obviously one of the great benefits of Zoom is that I can just mute people who, uh, who blather on for too long, but I'm sure we won't have that, that problem tonight. Um, we'll have some sharp and pointed uh, introductions to get us thinking again about this topic and how we, as it were, can return to normal. Uh, as I say, uh, I'll hand over to them as soon as I can. Do remember to head to academyofideas.org.uk slash donate. But for now, I'd very much like to welcome you all this evening and begin uh, kicking off what I hope will be a very productive and genuinely public 
conversation on these very important issues. So um, I think we're recording, which is great. Uh, so I will put um, Ben on spotlight and we'll head over to him and let's, uh, let's get things kicked off. I should, usually at the beginning, we've been spending a bit of time telling people how to use Zoom, but I'm sort of hoping that most people are now quite familiar with all of that, whether you like it or loathe it. But, um, and, and any questions you can, I'm sure, just pop something in the chat and someone will be able to help you out. But um, the main thing when we get over onto the, the questions and comments from the floor, the main thing is obviously just use the raise hand function so that I know that you want to speak. Um, but I guess without any further ado, I'll, uh, I'll pop over to Ben and he'll kick things off for us. So welcome Ben. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. Thank you Academy of Ideas for having me on and for everyone for tuning in. Um, it seems that we live in anything but normal times. Last year, I think the word unprecedented was used um, liberally in the context of the constitutional crisis we, we, we faced with Brexit and a hung parliament and everything else. And this year, no one could have predicted, again, this sort of uh, extraordinary set of circumstances, which, again, for altogether different reasons, are uh, unprecedented. So without wishing to jump too far ahead and give you my own answer, I think that there is bound to be uh, a new normal. I think it's virtually impossible that we can go back to the normal if we want to define normal as the status quo before the pandemic kicked off. Everything has changed since um, the beginning of March. And I'm not really talking in a kind of utopian, green, revolutionary, everyone's going to be happy as we come out of this pandemic uh, way. I mean, I, actually, I see the future as being very bleak. I'm sad to say I'm going to be a bit of a Debbie Downer on a Wednesday evening. But I see the future is really very bleak in the medium term um, and, uh, and into the long term. And I say that for, for two reasons. The first reason is I think that the government has created a crisis of confidence in the nation. And I don't think, funny enough, that this crisis comes from their inability to, path, to, to, to forge a sure-footed path through the pandemic. I think all of us would have been prepared um, to forgive them their errors because, you know, which country had seen the kind of stuff that we've now seen in the last three months. They were dealing with something, as I've already said a couple of times, an unprecedented uh, situation. And so perhaps we can forgive them for um, releasing the elderly, who we knew right at the beginning would be vulnerable, releasing them from hospitals into care homes where, uh, untested, where the virus could spread and the most vulnerable age group could, uh, could get infected. Perhaps we can forgive them for not locking down flights from Wuhan and from Milan early on when we knew that those two places, uh, you know, were hotbeds for the virus. Perhaps we can forgive them for being unprepared with PPE, ICU beds, initially turning their back on testing and tracing and then now saying that actually testing and tracing is of fundamental importance. I think, you know, all these errors, including, um, you know, the, 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 the title of this presentation, which, is, uh, which includes masks, you know, at first is stewing the use of masks, saying they don't confer much protection, and now all of a sudden saying, in fact, they're needed. You know, I, I think the populace would be prepared to forgive all of that. But the reason I think we've got a crisis of confidence is an altogether more subtle reason. I think it's born out of the morphing of government aims as we've gone through this pandemic. You'll all recall, no doubt, Boris Johnson saying that the aim of the lockdown was to squash the sombrero. And that made perfect sense to me. The idea behind it was to control the virus, uh, reduce the rate of infection so that the NHS could cope. And once the NHS could cope, we would, have, we, we would find some way to sort of rub along with the virus and get back to life as normal. But pretty early on, and I think it's borne out slightly as a result of Boris's predilection with military metaphors. He decided that, you know, controlling the virus, squashing the sombrero wasn't good enough. We had to defeat it. And if you listen to all the messaging from government, it's all about defeating the virus. Well, that's an impossible task in the absence of a vaccine. 
So what we went from was a situation of uh, staying at home, protecting the NHS and saving lives to a position where actually every illness needed to be fought off. Every potential death had to be warded away. That any, any death were, were, was effectively a failure in this battle to defeat the virus. He took the precautionary principle to the nth level. And it is that, I think, that it is the heart of the nation's lack of confidence now. Um, and the other thing that I think the government's got really wrong is putting out appropriate and proportionate messages about the virus. For example, may, maybe lots of you know this, but you know the average age of people who've died from the virus without pre-existing conditions is 81. Um, the total number of people under the age of 45 who died from the virus is 300. But if you walk down the street and you ask the average punter, you know, whether we're at risk from the virus, they will all say we are. They don't recognize that actually if you're under the age of 45 and you're not, you don't have a pre-existing condition, actually the chances of you being hit by lightning are much higher um, than dying from the virus. So I think we've got a disproportionate message from the, from the government and one where, which is in confrontation with the virus in a, in a pursuit to defeat it. And I think that has created a crisis of confidence in the nation and getting us back to work, therefore, unlocking the lockdown is going to be very hard with that pervading lack of confidence. Okay. Then the second, uh, second. Can, we, can we get you to wrap up pretty quickly? To get, uh, oh, right, okay, sorry, I'm only halfway through, but, um, okay, so the, se the second reason that I, I think we're going to be in for a really tough time is that the government hasn't understood the importance uh, of, uh, of dealing with this pandemic with utter robust financial um, uh, resolution. They were very good with the package that they brought together, the 350 billion package that they brought together to effectively comatose the um, comatose the economy and to protect us while we were in lockdown. But I'm afraid that the Conservative Party um, fiscal, uh, so, so the, the attitude of fiscal rectitude, which is typical of the Conservatives, has kicked in far too early. What they needed um, um, and what Rishi needed to announce two months, uh, two weeks ago, was not the timid package he announced, but a very robust set of growth measures. And that would have required taking on more debt. I okay. think I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, but I, I think yeah. we've completely fluffed it on the economic stimulus required to get back to normal. And um, so because of the crisis of confidence and because of the lack of, uh, uh, of boldness by the uh, Conservative government to actually get the economy going, I think we're going to have mass unemployment. The poor are going to be very badly affected. Yeah. And I think it's going to take years to recover. I'm sorry about that, Debbie Downer, but I'll, I will stop there. Okay, cheers, Ben. Th th thanks for that. It's important to obviously face the issues we face with a bit of um, a bit of realism as well. So th don't apologise for being Debbie Downer, but that's um, that's a great way to kick off. Um, I'll, I'll move swiftly on um, on to Rebecca. So Rebecca, I'll stick you on spotlight. Thanks very much, Jacob. So I'm going to spend my five minutes talking about normal. Now, whenever I hear this word, I think of Jeanette Winston's autobiographical book, Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. This title, of course, does not reflect Winston's own view of things. Rather, according to the book, it's a phrase her mother used to taunt her about her sexuality. Now, obviously, Winston's mother is contrasting normality with happiness, and there's lots I could say about that, which I don't have time for now. Instead, I want to point out that in this coronavirus moment, I think what's generally happening is not that people are contrasting normality with happiness, but rather that they are conflating the two. When most people say, oh, I just want to return to normal, what I think they really mean is, I want to return to doing the things I used to enjoy doing before COVID came along because they make me happy, or more fully perhaps because I value them. Now key to unpacking this is to recognise that normality is relative. So what's normal to me, the generalities and the particulars of that, won't be neatly normal for you. It's not normal for you to type on my laptop or to wake up next to my boyfriend. Yes, you probably have your own laptop and uh, you may have a boyfriend, you may not. The point is that maybe you want or need either or neither of those things. Not my particular boyfriend, I hope. But my point is that normality, and more importantly, the extent to which we value it, is dependent on our needs and preferences, our principles and values. And those are different for each of us. 
even though we may share some important overlaps. Okay, you might think normality has some value of its own related to stability or something, but I'm not really convinced by that. I don't want to return to the normality of avoiding highwaymen when traveling between towns or queuing for bread in a Soviet labor camp, no matter how stable those situations were for the people to whom they became normal. No, the value of normality, I'm pretty sure, is dependent on the value of the stuff referred to as normal. Now, maybe you're wondering where I'm going with this. Maybe you're thinking, oh, she's going to do that whole, we should use the pandemic to fix the world thing, that I'm going to suggest we you know, break free from the fundamental structures of society, free from our capitalist masters, allow individuals to find their inner truths and so on. Well, I'm happy to talk about those ideas, but it's really not where I'm going now. Rather, I really want to take this opportunity to stress how depressed I've been by the so-called libertarian response to the pandemic even more so perhaps than by the inhuman consequentialist response that tells us old people are worth less than the young. I personally never expect much from consequentialists, but I do expect more from people genuinely committed to freedom. And what's depressed me about the libertarian response is not only a seeming keenness in some circles to embrace bad information, to delight in spreading unsubstantiated claims alongside a failure to seemingly show any interest at all in holding the state to account, when it spreads this bad information itself, when it lies to us, and when it uses manipulation against us. But also, by a seeming kindness, sorry, a seeming keenness to hound and seek to restrain others, to publicly criticize them for choosing to wear masks, for instance. Now, both of these things are a lack of interest in good information and the state's suppression of it, and an avidity for, well, oftentimes chiding sneers, seem to me genuinely inimical to a philosophy grounded in equal freedom and equal respect. A philosophy that, unlike anarchism, recognises that there is value to being part of a political society, and that with that comes responsibility, new obligations to each other, um, as people we share societal interests with. That's what the common good is. And it's been critical to classical, liberal, libertarian thought, central to Locke, to Adam Smith, to all those good guys. And for quite a while now, I've been thinking that, you know, those of us who claim a core commitment to freedom seem really at serious risk of forgetting about it. The reason I don't spit in other people's faces is not because the state tells me not to. I don't need the state to tell me that. Rather, I don't do it because I know it's wrong. Because other people are living, breathing, reasoning human beings like me, with different needs and preferences from mine, yes, and different normals and happinesses, different understandings of what, is, what it is to value something, of what it is that counts as value. Sure, some of these people are really annoying, and some of them seem just plain wrong about many things. But respect for that, respect for them as human beings, is what grounds a commitment to pluralism. It also underpins the understanding that when the state tries to make us good people, and when we leave that to the state by behaving badly towards each other, not only does the state impose its view of what good is onto us, but also this can crowd out our capacity for natural virtue. So, returning to normal, well, if the normality we want is, being is tied to being able to do the things that we value, then it must also be tied to a recognition of the need to respect the people around us those we know and those we don't know. And to return to that conflation between, normal, between normal and happy, it means that when I think I want to return to doing the things I used to enjoy doing before COVID came along, I also have to bake my consideration for other people into that thought. And for me, I simply wouldn't be happy doing those normal things if I thought that my doing them would put others at unreasonable risk. Now, of course, we each need to assess what unreasonable is here based on the information we have, which is partly why having that good information is so important and why it's so dreadfully wrong that the state has been suppressing this information, but also the principles that guide us. And we also need to think about the extent to which any of this is just about being happy rather than, as I said, valuing things or being fulfilled or something thicker. But setting aside some of our normal, immediate preferences, choosing to change our everyday behaviours, owing to the new, unusual context in which we find ourselves, when we have good reason to believe that doing so will further the common good is not to have our freedom restricted. And it is certainly not to be subject to an authoritarian state, although believe me, I have a great deal to criticize, criticize the state for now and most days. But normal can change, however, and surely that's not always bad. What remains constant are the good values and principles alongside a commitment to the truth, both scientific and moral, that we can use to help us choose how to act and interact as decent reasoning free members of a shared society. Thanks.
Great. Thanks a lot, Rebecca. It's very, very useful and very helpful to take a step back uh, and think philosophically for a moment as, as you just did. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to pass this over to uh, Claire. Again, I'll stick you on spotlight. Um, if you could unmute yourself. Great. You're, you're, you're already very right, lovely. Well, just following on from that, I would like to say it wasn't completely hunky dory before COVID. And we have to remind ourselves that. The problems in my neck of the wood in, in the NHS where staff were at the rock bottom in terms of burnout, mental illness and, and thus unsustainable workloads. And as a society, we had turned a blind eye to the problems faced by our BAME colleagues. And we also were ignoring and had ignored the problems of social care. So going forward, it has to be better from where we've come from. And we need to learn from the response that we've just had, good and bad, during COVID, so that we're better prepared for the next spike, which will inevitably happen. We meet, need to make sure that in minimising the health risks, we don't, as we have grave risk of doing at the moment, increase inequalities through the dire economic consequences of our response. The biggest sacrifices have been demanded of the young, who have lost their incomes, their opportunities, and of children who have lost precious months of their education to protect their grandparents. As Ben said, COVID is predominantly a disease of the elderly, or at least the adverse uh, outcome of it is. The over 80s have a 20 times greater risk of death than somebody in their 50 to 60s, and a far, far greater risk of death than those under 50 years of age. As the prevalence in the community of, of COVID rises, so as we test more and more people and find them to be positive, so the death rate as a proportion is actually dropping and we have to bear that in mind. Now health is more than the absence of disease and there is more to life than avoiding death. And I think going forward, things have to uh, return to normal, but it will be incredibly hard to do so because the fear of the fear which the response has induced in all of us. And with its phys physical manifestation, that of masks, which actually I think have a, a deep psychological uh, issue about them, not least the, the protection of, of, of the virus, but there is something deeply, deeply psychological about people's response to masks and all the, 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 the images that they put on the front of one, them, but maybe that will come up in the debate. Now, splits are already occurring in society, unlike at the start when we were all clapping for each other and all so perfect with each other. Splits are now centred about the rights and wrongs of the deprivation of liberty, the tension between individual rights and public health. And we don't all have the same appetite for accepting risk, and we never will. Some of us will always remain anxious. And, and the, 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 the uh, ability or the, the willingness to tolerate risk is not evenly distributed in the, in the population. A recent Mori poll actually found that it's roughly just over a third uh, think the government is doing a very good job and they're the trusting group and just about the right uh, amount of restrictions. Uh, just over a third think the government isn't going far enough and want far more restrictions and don't want lockdown to be released. And just under a third are frustrated and think the restrictions should be lifted sooner. Now, oddly, these groups are, are largely aligned to how you vote, not just in the parliamentary elections, but also how you voted in the Brexit elections. And if you want to ask me later, I'll tell you what, how they pan out. So it's complicated uh, how we go forward. Now, we are in a better position. I'm not as nihilistic as Ben is. I think we are, we're in a much better position going forward than we were going back. I think we understand the virus a lot better. We understand who's at risk and how to protect these people at risk. We have better treatments and better management. We've learned how to work together, certainly across the NHS we have, and we have a vaccine uh, which looks very optimistic. But we have to accept some uncertainties. We have to accept that we can never stop risk completely. And we have to accept that we can never make things safe. We can only make things safer. So where am I in all of this? I think we should return to normal ASAP. I actually think we should have returned to normal once we had the capacity at the Nightingale, which had 4,000 uh, ITU beds, because if this response was predicated on, on protecting the NHS and ensuring we had enough capacity in the NHS, well, 4,000 beds at the Nightingale, to me, is enough capacity probably for the whole of England. So I think we need to return as soon as possible. I think at worst, we need to give the public 
choices based on their own appetite for risk and their own appetite based on their own personal risk. And finally, I never thought I would say this, but I think we need to trust our politicians who have the unenviable task of making the wrong decisions for at least half of those that they serve. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Claire. That was, that was very, very useful. Um, thanks for taking us through some of that. Um, again, moving swiftly on so we can fit everyone in, uh, hand over to Anna Elizabeth. Um, and first of all, you, the, the picture you see behind me is a picture that I took just before getting into the conversation for the balcony of where I am in southern Germany. Uh, and I've lived, I've been locked down in France for, you know, the entire uh, COVID crisis, which is not finished, but locked down. And um, as you know, I write for an English newspaper, so perhaps I have a kind of international view on this, and it's not going to be as well organized as everybody else's, but basically, you know, uh, um, five points I'd like to make, five and a half points. First of all, um, that uh, the instability, the notion of instability is probably the most dangerous and we know in physics how unstable, um, uh, what instability means and how very dangerous it is and I think it's exactly the same for societies and I'll, I'll go a little bit in this in, in a bit more. We have a political instability and the political instability is of course in America. America is uh, in the worst situation of, of uh, all our countries basically because they are in an election year and at the time of this election year they have what I would call a Spartacus moment in which there is a quasi uprising in some areas of America and the possibility of a uh, 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 blowback that would be very dangerous. Uh, I'm not even going to um, uh, uh, sort of uh, talk about the election itself, but I think all of this is due to uh, what Ben mentioned in the beginning, and which is a question of confidence, and it's very obvious that America is the country where they've most lost confidence um, in, in Donald Trump, but not necessarily just also in a system where uh, you could not, you, you had no uh, um, public health care of any quality, and therefore uh, you were much more affected by, uh, by the, the crisis and also because the economic crisis which is coming to us and which is going to be a pretty terrifying is also something in which uh, uh, Americans are disproportionately hit compared to us in Britain or in Europe. Um, and finally, uh, this has been addressed, but uh, uh, the health crisis is also a crisis of various systems. I was very interested in saying that the NHS feel that they are at the end of their tether, basically. Uh, the, the French look at the NHS, and I'm, I'm saying this just because uh, they, the, the, my, my, the medical people I've interviewed and the medical friends I have have said how much they admire the doctors in the NHS and how much they do not admire the system in, in uh, rationing medicine and also in making it much more difficult to cope fewer, fewer doctors for any kind of department in a non-emergency time and of course fewer ICU beds and uh, fewer people in a time of emergency. Uh, France is more or less in the middle of this. Uh, uh, with Germany uh, having more beds and having uh, a better response, not only because there was uh, the hospital capacity and the means and, and, and the uh, health system had not been staffed. Germany has got a health system that is both private and public uh, and which is uh, the better, which, for which they spend more of GDP and uh, which essentially is well funded and that makes a huge difference. Uh, but also which is well organized because it's decentralized. It's, it's uh, done by the Lander, the, uh, uh, the 14 regions of Germany. So that was, that's the, this, this is to say that the entire situation has been basically uh, 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 hitting at every possible thing that uh, 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 keeps us together, which explain the lack of confidence. The second point I wanted to make is that Britain probably, from my views outside Britain, uh, is coming into this in a situation of uh, hyperpolarization because it happened uh, at the time of Brexit, uh, which means that there was less desire to trust politicians and there was less desire not to be partisan than there would have been otherwise. I think most countries, except Britain and America, have understood that their, the, 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 their uh, political leaders, as uh, was explained, have tried uh, to, to keep the country together, but there is no trust. There, were, there was a trust for a little moment, partly because there was the sort of magical, in the term of medieval moment, in which Boris Johnson was himself touched 
by the illness. And I think that was something that drew the country together. But the, the impression of lack of decision um, has, been, has been something that has destroyed uh, uh, the, the will of people to, to put their trust. And I think that in, in the government, and that will explain to my mind the reason why people are reacting so badly to the idea of wearing masks. I come in a country where people are notoriously uh, um, um, uh, undisciplined, where uh, the president is massively disliked. He's got, he polls worse than uh, any other European leader right now. Uh, he did before the crisis and it, he hasn't been held by the crisis. Our outcomes were uh, uh, median. We didn't do as well as Germany, but we certainly did better than Britain. There's one figure that sticks in my mind that was given me by the head of COVID reaction for Hôpitaux de Paris, which is all French hospitals. And he said, uh, people, the, the prognosis uh, for people in ICU coming out alive was 50% in Britain, and it was 15% in France. And that is really something that shocks you. And I'm, I'm talking under the, uh, 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 the observation of our, our doctor uh, participant. Finally, um, if, if we can make this a quick one, um, and love Anne Elizabeth, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, the uh, um, finally, the, you know, the thing I'd like to sort of uh, throw into the conversation and hope that uh, somebody, uh, somebody will um, uh, uh, pick it up, uh, and it's the, sorry, uh, it, and it's the, the EU plan that was signed now, and I'm very happy that Ben is with us because he will give us the Brexit Party opinion on this, but the idea that there was, uh, even if it's not the best deal, even if it uh, was uh, obtained after five days of negotiation day and night, is something that is bringing a bit of optimism in that the idea is that you are not alone when this happens to you. Our economies are hit, our economies will be hit for a long time. What worries me about the European plan, I'm very happy that the European plan was reached. I don't think it will be perfect. I think it will be better. The one thing that worries me is that it may not help the people who need help the most, which are small businesses, uh, uh, individual people, and uh, it will disproportionately help the people who are able to cope with the bureaucracy needed to, to apply and to, to qualify for, for subsidies. And I suspect these will be big, large corporations and, and, and state enterprises, and that's my only worry. But still, I think it's, it's an it's a, it's a idea of hope that the continent is more or less uh, uh, bringing together, bringing themselves together and doing something that didn't happen during the financial crisis. That's the end of it. Great. Thanks, Anne Elizabeth. Thanks for uh, bringing some of that international perspective to bear. Very, very useful. Um, I'll hand over again, uh, moving quickly, I'll hand over to Norman. Hello. Um, good evening. Um, sorry if this is going to cause psychological disorder to a number of people watching this, but uh, I thought I'd just wear this to uh, um, highlight the fact that I'm actually in Italy, um, near Lake Como, and um, it is almost normal that people are wearing these things, but no one really believes in them. Um, what I'd like to do is just something slightly different to what uh, the other speakers have done, which is that um, I suppose I would also question the whole notion of the new normal, uh, precisely because I think what the narrative around the whole new no uh, normal does is it naturalizes the old normal as if this is the only choice that we have, that what we have now, we have this kind of binary choice but whether we wear masks or we don't whether we social distance or we don't um, as if we are dealing with a natural phenomenon as if this crisis that we've uh, uh, experienced um, was objectively given that it was inevitable that we had to go down the path that we did um, and i want to challenge that because i think that's very very dangerous because that gets us into a space that limits the imagination and limits what we could possibly be thinking about in terms of what we might want to do or what we need to do um, going out of this crisis. So the old normal was nothing to write home about. I think a number of speakers have already made that point. It was not a, a picnic for the vast majority of people. It was failing. It was stagnant economics. It was low productivity. Um, we had already a high degree of atomization and social identitarian distancing. Uh, there's nothing new in any of that. What happened during the crisis was that all of this just speeded up to a large extent. Um, the point really is that the old normal was already in much need of radical challenge and change 
before anyone had even heard of COVID-19. Um, and that's something we should keep in mind because it's not good enough to go back to the old normal or to use that as the standard upon which we should be measuring where we should be going in the future. It's quite interesting, I find, that, that in this discussion that you know, we, we're at a time where the woke elite are rejecting binary thinking. But they've accepted a binary thought around uh, the old, the, the new um, normal being the natural state of, of affairs now, that the challenges facing us are, will we have to wear masks? Will we social distance? When will we be able to hug each other? When will we be able to just be normal? Um, and you've got this kind of binary of these choices, but the choices that we're actually being offered is to go back to something that needed reform in the first place. Um, and if we simply go along with that, if we get drawn down this route of talking about what the new normal is, if we normalize the new normal, then what we're essentially doing is we're accepting the limits that were in place uh, and which are, are, are the cause of, of so much of the problem that we have today. I think that the, so what I'd like to do is just slight, be perhaps slightly more optimistic because I think um, the, the, the question that is posed to me by the new normal is, you know, what choice should we make as a society? Um, you know, the, 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 what's been offered to us, uh, I don't think, I think are fool's choices. I think what we have seen during the crisis, and this is perhaps something we can return to in the discussion, that there have been some very positive things that have taken place. For example, I think, um, it's quite, quite an interesting um, observation, that for the first time, uh, a brief moment in history, every company, every corporation in the world had to abandon their virtue signaling mission statements and concentrate on protecting their workers, their customers, and their businesses. Suddenly the missions, the purpose of business, suddenly changed from all these lofty, um, you know, nice woke um, environmental um, recognition of, of diversity, etc. All of us, all of a sudden they were faced with something which was very real, which was their very survival, their workers protecting their customers, protecting their businesses. And innovation, which has just been marketing hoopla for many, many years, is now posed as a very real thing that has to happen if we are going to get out of this. And th more positively, there have been a number of things that have happened that I think indicate that society, there is an openness or a willingness to think about re-engineering some of the things, re-engineering our societies. So for example, if you look at how artificial intelligence, for example, has been brought into the NHS, has been brought into to hospitals for triage, which for years has been taken months and months of committee meetings and regulation and, and precaution, et cetera, that has prevented this from, from taking place, has now been brought in because people have said, we've got no choice, we've just got to implement this and we'll, whatever risks are involved, we'll have to mitigate them and we'll have to manage them. And as a consequence, you've now got AI being used in, in triage, which is actually really benefiting um, the identification of people with COVID um, and other diseases, et cetera. And that is a very positive development, in my opinion. Um, and it indicates that under necessity, we have really begun to embrace the idea that things could be done differently, that, that this is a choice that, uh, that, that, that we really need to, 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 to be thinking about. So the point, the point I'm really stressing is that we are not facing binary opposites of two naturalized forms of limits, whether it's the, what, the, the, the naturalization of the COVID crisis or the old normal. Um, if, you, if you really want to see what, why I think this is the case. We end on this point, Norman. Yeah, I'm going to end on this point. Just look at the masks issue. The fact that there was all this confusion, does it help, doesn't, uh, no one really knows. But the fact that now we are being told that it's compulsory to wear masks is very clear that this has got very little to do with COVID-19. This is really just another manifestation of contemporary society's culture of distrust, particularly of the masses, of the Brexit voting masses in particular, um, 
um, who the elite in the old normal have always regarded as dangerous, as diseased, um, etc. And all that kind of says to me is that what we've really got to be focusing upon is what we have seen in many instances of what people have done, which is that they have used their common sense, even, even in the face of, of government compulsion. Um, and in fact, their reaction, their overreaction to the fear and, and the uncertainty, which is quite natural given how this has played up and, 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 and entered into the imaginations of people, is actually an expression of the fact that people do exercise their moral authority. Um, and that's something that's very positive. And that's something for me is what will create something new in the future, not a new normal, but a new future altogether. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, uh, Norman. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I said when we kick things off that we certainly wouldn't uh, be able to come to any answers easily and we'd be better to stir things up and start the public conversation. And I think that, I mean, that's obviously been borne out by our opening remarks, but it also means that I can thankfully vacate the, uh, the need to try and resolve some of this stuff as much as I'd like to get stuck in because much more important is to uh, get some reactions and get some points out from what in real, in normal life, uh, despite Norman, Norman's point, in normal life would be the floor, but here is the list of hands on the, on the Zoom meeting. So I will go straight out. Um, we've got a few hands up already. Just to remind you, if you do want to speak, you can go down to the bottom of your screen where there's a little participants icon, which you can click on, and then you'll see all the participants and there'll be a button there that, that says, raise hands. So do get stuck in that way. But first, I'm going to go over to uh, Paul, who's got his hand up. Uh, Paul, over to you. Hi there. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me. Uh, this is obviously all brilliant. Loads of things to discuss, but I'm just picking up on a point uh, that Norman, I think, made near the end when he was talking about uh, we're in a position where necessity is kind of driving innovation. Um, and I, I can see the point in some ways that any kind of innovation or change is a good thing given we haven't really particularly had it but it occurred to me that there's an element of this is what sort of environmentalists and greens are kind of arguing to a certain extent and I'm pretty sure that's not what Norman was making but it occurred to me that you know that the idea of necessity is a mother invention and stuff is is, is very much a, a, a system based around constraints etc and, and 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 I agree that is in many cases a good driver but I suppose my point is is how can we also actively move to a position where innovation is actively made rather than driven by necessity so I, that's just the uh, brief point I wanted to make I guess so uh, I guess I mean my concern about this um, is that I, I, I the problem is is that the less we uh, participate in real social interactions um, and the more that we focus on emotionalism which is I think uh, what is going on in social media the more difficult or the more likely it is that we lose the habit of being able to talk to people to resolve disputes just to you know kind of interact in a civil way in a way that we you know, just took for granted before because we were doing it all the time. Um, so that really concerns me. Um, and I've been trying to think about how to kind of repose uh, that problem um, so that we can, instead of focusing on making everybody safe, we can focus on actually adapting. And I think one of the good, best ways to do that is to focus on the future, and in particular, to focus on the chil on uh, on kids and why they need to have those uh, need to have school, need to have those um, interactions with people. Um, and um, yeah, that that's all I want to say. Right. Thanks, Nancy. Um, thanks for that. I'll head over to uh, Jagdish now. Oh, hi. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, I, I tend to kind of disagree partly with what uh, Abib was saying, which is about the crisis of confidence. Although I think I can see that there is an element of that. There is crisis of confidence because it's very difficult to find anybody who agrees that the government has led us through this kind of crisis in a way which they uh, feel is credible. Everybody's got something that they're cynical about, they're not happy with. And it seems like people have just got their own kind of uh, particular 
bits that they don't like and they have their own thoughts about what is missing in all of this, I think, and there is a big vacuum now, it seems, is an, some kind of a proper reinforced kind of a coherent alternative, um, which is lacking. So people are kind of floundering a little bit, I think, out there. And it's, it's so in that sense, although I partly kind of agree with what Norman was saying about binary, but I think the binary is more about, you know, either people agree with what the government is doing or they're cynical. It's not a choice between what the government is saying and an alternative, uh, which people can kind of uh, kind of cohere around. So I think the, the vacuum that is there, uh, unless the all left or the left or somebody comes to fill it with an alternative, coherent kind of uh, narrative, then it's very likely that the most cynical kind of uh, and possibly right wing and so on people could could kind of step into the mark. The analogy, I suppose, would be if you had a car, which I where I agree with Norman that a lot of problems pre-existed and all this COVID is doing is it's brought uh, all of those things to the fore. The analogy is like a failing vehicle. A vehicle was crap before. And all we're doing now is some people are saying, well, if you change the tires, it'll be fine. Or if you change the engine, it'll be fine. Or if you change the mirrors, et cetera, et cetera. But what it needs is a fundamental rethink about what kind of vehicle we need to go forward. So I think that's probably uh, what I wanted to say. Thanks. Great. Th thanks for that, uh, Jagdish. I'll go over to uh, Alex Cameron's next up. Uh, can I actually turn your video on if you can, Alex? Uh, go ahead. My, my video is not working. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, oh, thank you. I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, 20 euros to anybody that can find the question in here. Um, I live in Madrid. Uh, it's 38 degrees every other day here, uh, so we spend a lot of time at the pool. Um, one of the most tragic things I've seen um, in the past however many years um, is a two-year-old baby toddling about in its nappy wearing a mask. Now, I only mention this because um, in conversation, things that I'm reading, um, this question of the mask seems to be um, of primary concern to most people. Um, and uh, the, 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 the use of the mask here, everybody wears them, even in the street, um, doesn't begin to tell you um, the public's reaction um, to this moment, I think. Um, it's an authoritarian impulse on the part of the elite that they're demanding the use of the mask. And on the part of the public, I think it's just pragmatic and it's a considerate um, action by them. An example being, and it's only a little example, my wife visited an eight-year-old uh, woman who wants to learn English um, alongside her um, in-laws and they were all wearing masks and very quickly my partner was saying, should I put a mask on? And they were saying, well, no, we only wear them because we were worried that you would be worried. So everybody's renegotiating relationships, but ultimately, in my experience, everybody's quite happy to take them off. Thanks for that, um, Alex. Thanks for that. Um, next time, we'll definitely prefer video to the, um, the, the picture that you, you, you put up. <laughs> um, uh, thanks. I'm going to go over to, I'm going to get Jan in, then I'm going to get the panel in for some quick, Reactions. I'll stress to the panel to uh, sort of, I mean, obviously we've got a lot to get through, so just try and pick up on one thing. But first I'll go to Jan McVarish. Yeah, I think there are some positive aspects to it in the sense of what's become very clear and t t uh, trends that have, were implicit have become very explicit. Just so a few of those. One is that expertise is um, unresolved. I should think it's become very clear to everybody. Secondly, there's no such thing as the science. Um, Thirdly, the need to balance risks and that that's a really important societal decision that we need to make. And also the, the, the reality of unintended consequences has become very clear with this. For example, the care homes um, issue. Um, fourthly, that public health can become a tyranny and it isn't just a benign good that we all need more of. Uh, fifth, the problems of petty divisions and petty judgments raises the question of well, uh, to what extent and when should we judge other people's behaviour and when should we let that ride and how should we deal with it. Uh, sixth, I think we're on, um, there are some, some nascent arguments for life and freedom 
and the kind of smaller freedoms that don't already have a name really so not things that necessarily the ones we already know about freedom of movement freedom to um, freedom of speech but the freedom to go to the pub the freedom to go to the park the freedom to make decisions amongst your own family members for example to hold that barbecue two weeks before the ban was list lifted those kinds of freedoms i think somehow we need to create a name for and they, these are things that have been raised and then finally i think there's some really interesting questions about the family being raised by this um, you know parents have been blamed now for about 20 years and much maligned in policy and public discourse um, but in this crisis they've been just absolutely burdened and relied upon in a really unquestioning kind of way apart from the odd stories about domestic violence and child abuse but by and large the assumption has been that families are up to the job of doing everything for their children um, now I don't think that's right I think parenting, uh, raising children is a shared responsibility, but nevertheless there's been something of a readjustment in some ways of the balance of that previous assumption that families and parents can just be maligned very simplistically. Um, and so there's some, I just think there's some really interesting questions that have come up that there's no reason why these will go forward in a progressive way, but they, they're there to be, because they're now exposed, they can be developed. Thanks a lot, uh, Jan, thanks for that. Um, so I want to get the panel back in. Um, I think I'll just take you again in the order that, that you spoke. So Ben, I'm going to turn to you and just ask you to pick up like one thing from there or respond to something that one of the other panelists said, but we'll try and keep this brief. Sorry, some fantastic points made by my fellow speakers as well as everyone else. And um, I would just say that I hadn't, you know, completely developed my economic argument, but I think that we're going to be washed over with an economic crisis. I think that's unavoidable. So any kind of new normal we're going to have is going to be preceded by a protracted period of economic difficulty and economic recovery. And um, we are going to end up with a lot more debt um, as a nation, as well as personally, we're going to have, I think, virtual certainty, we're gonna have mass unemployment, we're gonna have mass youth unemployment, and we are going to have potentially civil disobedience and we've discussed some of the early signs of that so I, I see the new normal um, which is going to emerge in the sort of immediate to midterm future as being really quite bleak and that any real opportunity to head off the economic crisis and therefore engender some of the new normals that we've been discussing some of the sort of brighter new normals I think that opportunity sadly has been lost um, so, you know, a bit of a Debbie Downer again, but I'll, I'll end there. Cheers, Ben. Um, okay, I'll come over to Rebecca. I'm going to stick you on spotlight. Um, if you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Great, yeah. Um, so I suppose, again, sort of focus on the need to be specific. So when we talk about, you know, whether innovation is good, well, I mean, it kind of depends on what innovation you're talking about and what your conception of good is. But I'm going to avoid philosophizing anymore. And I'm just going to say that I totally agree that there's much, much more that can be done to support innovation in the sense of like entrepreneurship um, ensuring that we have a good um, ecosystem environment for, for small business and particularly for growing business and I think that's the case generally so I think there's much more to be done particularly in terms of like supply side stuff and um, freeing up regulations um, allowing but you know freeing up some sources uh, of capital as regulation liberalization in terms of pension fund industry for instance but I would say I'm particularly worried about small and growing small businesses at the moment um, a lot of them have taken on debt, sometimes when they weren't even really credit worthy and they already had debt. Um, they've deferred the tax payments, they'll come, be coming out of this with weak balance sheets um, and trading losses. And it's just literally the case that peak insolvencies tend to be happening in the sort of recovery period of an economic crisis. Um, so there's going to be a serious re recapitalization need, um, particularly regarding equity. These companies aren't probably going to just need yet more debt, they're also going to need business advice. Um, and it's already the case that it's particularly hard for smaller and growing companies for you know, various sort of classic reasons um, about economy of scale for investors and stuff. Um, so I'm concerned there's a lot of policy discussion about this stuff at the moment, but I don't really feel it's focusing on the right stuff. And I'd agree with something I think Ben started to say earlier, which was about a focus on growth. This is not just about protecting companies that might have been you know, solvent four months ago. It's about thinking about the longer term growth within 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 the country and you know SMEs are the backbone of the economy and particularly growing companies um, that's sort of where the economic future lies and I think that's been missed out quite a bit in what's generally been a you know relatively sort of decent 
attempt by the government to, you know, as someone else previously said, I think put things on ice. Um, now is the moment where we really need to, you know, differentiate and I would argue particularly look at those small and growing companies. Great, thanks Rebecca. Um, Claire, I'll come over to you. Yeah, thank you. And what amazing comments everybody's made. Ben, I think you need to come and see me in my sick doctor service so I can give you some antidepressants uh, if that's allowed. I'm not sure it's, it's as nihilistic as you say. And I think we're of a certain age, to be honest. If you ask my children, my son's marriage has been postponed. There's meant to be 150 people. There's going to be nine. He's marrying the woman he loves. It's fine. You know, I think that the youth have optimism. And I think at our age, we realise that we've lost it. My worry is, as many of you have articulated, that every pandemic, every single pandemic we've ever had disproportionately affects the poor and the deprived. And this one is doing exactly the same. And unless we address that, and, and at the start, if you remember, I got COVID and while I was lying in my bed in this sort of delirious state, I was watching back to back TV as one does, sort of in, in and out. And there was a debate about herd immunity and somebody from Scotland said, well, we should put all the elderly, hypothetically, put all the elderly over 80 up in Scotland, cocoon them for 12 weeks and let everybody else get on as normal. Now, he was derided and it was, you know, he was trying to kill people and this and that. But actually, though he was saying it in jest because you couldn't cocoon people, you know, you couldn't do that. But, you know, we did it in the Second World War with children. But nevertheless, this idea of herd immunity became a dirty word when, in fact, what he was actually saying is we should protect those most at risk, absolutely most at risk, whilst allowing everybody else to get on with their lives and get the virus and, and, uh, and get some sort of immunity ahead of, ahead of the vaccine. And what we've had is 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 just a, a sort of mix of everything. We've had a, a sort of uh, let's, as I said, protect our grandmothers. Let's all lock down. Let's assume that we're all the same risk. And those of you of a certain age will remember HIV and the public health messages around HIV, which were all about we're all in the same boat. Well, we weren't all in the same boat. Absolutely, we weren't. And we lost many, many months, if not years, in trying to in protecting those most at risk by trying to assume that we were all in the same boat. And I think the same happened here but fundamentally i think we need to open up we need to re remove this, this fear that we've all got in us when people say oh thank god i was tested negative for covid as if it's like i was tested negative for hiv no actually test positive for covid if you've had an asymptomatic illness at very least uh, it means that you might possibly be immune which you probably are but we'll have to wait and see so I think we should open up. I do feel that we have to trust our politicians. I'm one of those that that maybe naively feels that I have to trust them because I I certainly don't trust in anarchy. So I have to trust them. And I really hope they have the strength, the absolute strength to do what they feel is the right thing to do based on evidence and based on the scientists, but not entirely directed by, by them. Because of course, politics is more than just a, a taking advice from one, one space and, and dealing with it. So, I'm not sure I've added much to the, the debate at all, but hey ho, hopefully we're going to get back to normal pretty soon. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Claire. Very, very helpful. It's nice to have a full for it, the defense of getting back out there. Um, Anne Elizabeth, over to you. Um, well, I, everybody was really interesting. I was, I was sort of uh, shaken by Jan's uh, statement that we now know that there is no science, there are no experts, and there is tyranny of public health. And I can, I can understand the frustration uh, in, in finding that uh, the, uh, the science is not exact yet, but that's the way of all science. And uh, I, you know, I don't like the idea that uh, there are, there's no such thing as experts. They actually are something as experts and they're sometimes odd with one another. Uh, and and uh, if you don't have the time, I don't know what the tyranny of public health is, but uh, I think the responsibility of, of the government and the responsibility of everyone is to try and ensure that at every level, whether it's personal responsibility or ensuring that access to public health exists in the system. Uh, uh, I mean, that is, the, I, you know, there's a difference between being a libertarian and just uh, having a free for all in which essentially at a time of, we of weakness, at a time of fragility, um, uh, every, everything that people could uh, rely on is, is uh, blown away. And what worries me about the reaction against the masks really is 
um, I don't like wearing a mask. Um, I have been tested for COVID and I'm unfortunate in that I haven't had it, as Claire was just saying, but uh, I know that I'm not contam going to contaminate someone, so I wear a mask essentially to reassure people around me because I think there must be some kind of social cohesion. But in most cases, people have not been tested for COVID for lots of reasons uh, that were also, that have also caused the last of trust, because the, la the loss of trust precisely because our governments were not able to provide enough testing. And uh, in, that re in that case, for most people, wearing the mask means that they're protecting others. And I don't think there's any tyranny in, in having a society at a time where everybody is scared, at a time when we have the breakdown of, of the economy uh, facing us. Uh, and to, to start having those great uh, sort of uh, uh, movements in which we say, oh no, this is, this is a, uh, that, that doesn't exist and I don't have to comply by it. It's not pleasant. Uh, I don't necessarily like being a lemming, but I think that, you know, first do no harm, and the idea is not doing harm is wearing a mask. Okay, great. Uh, the, thanks for that. I'll, I'll hand over to Norman, then we'll come back out to the floor, because those are hands going up. Thanks, Jacob. Um, well, on the, um, on the question of uh, the expertise and all of that that Jan raised, um, um, I, I think that there is definitely a crisis. Um, I think the problem is, has been the politicization of expertise, not expertise as such. But side with that has been the, the absence of political judgment and the exercise of political judgment by politicians, that the hiding behind the science, we are following the science, is just an expression of the fact that they have not been willing or able to uh, exercise judgment uh, in terms of how to mediate uh, the uncertainty and uh, the, the unknowability of, 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 of the crisis that we were facing. Um, but the interesting thing about that for me is I, I, I've been doing a lot of work on this is that if you look at the um, potential now of there being a vaccine uh, by Christmas, I mean, that is an absolutely remarkable achievement. In fact, where we've got to already is an absolutely remarkable achievement. And that is, is, is something we should, we should be looking at because what it shows is that when expertise is applied to a real problem um, and, and people collaborate and cooperate in the way that they have globally, we can, as a hum, uh, humanity, has got phenomenal potential and power to solve these problems. In fact, what you know, I would be looking at is how do we use this example and this experience to inspire young people to go into science? If anything, this is gonna prove science, real science, not, not the science, but real science. And it's an opportunity to, to reinvigorate um, ambition and uh, belief in the wonders of, of, of the human imagination, of uh, you know, our ability to to solve these problems. So I, I think that, again, you, I, I really don't want to draw too negative conclusions from all of this. It's, nothing is set here. The final point I just want to reiterate is that we, were, we cannot go back to how things were. For example, it's now absolutely obvious, and it must have been obvious to a child idiot, that you can't outsource your critical infrastructure to a country like China. Okay, you can't do it. It's just, it's, it's now absolutely necessary that Britain has to develop some kind of capability, which means it has to apply science and innovation and investment and all of these things to providing some kind of capacity for Britain to actually go into the 21st century. You cannot rely on this global uh, supply chain uh, which which has now been disrupted, which is now going to fragment even further under the autarkic tendencies that we see um, emerging in the international scene. Um, you know, these these are very real problems, and 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 this is really to 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 talk to the point that Ben has raised, which I think is is absolutely right. That you know we are going to face an unprecedented, and I use the word unprecedented, economic crisis. Um, that is going to rival the depression of the last century. There's no question about it. The mass unemployment, particularly, particularly youth unemployment, is going to go through the roof. I mean, I just saw some figures this week that something like 42% of the, 
of Americans don't have proper jobs at the moment. 42%. I mean, that is maybe double what it was during the Depression. And we haven't woken up to this yet. And, and so what I'm, what I'm concerned about is that we don't draw um, solely negative things. Though. The, these are, the reality is that we have got choices to make. And the choices are the ones that we should be putting on the table and starting to work out how can we actually begin to solve this. If anything, the demand for expertise and problem solving is going to, this is going to be the golden age of problem solving. Let's put it that way. Great. Thanks, Norman. I'm, I, I want to come uh, back out to the audience. I think it's a good challenge for all members of the audience. We need a sort of honest look at what has gone on and what has occurred during the pandemic, but we also need to look at what, what can we take forward, what can be built on, and ultimately, because that's the way that we'll, we'll get out of things. And I think it's a good challenge for us all collectively and everyone as part of the audience to start thinking together about how we can do that. So I'm going to head over to um, Alan Kosler. Hello, uh, boy, I'm talking to you from the United States. First, I want to say that focusing purely on mortality is the wrong thing to focus on. But just looking at mortality, in the United States, 1,200 doctors and nurses who are under 55 have died of COVID. So it's definitely not as small as being hit by lightning. Secondly, you really have to look at morbidity. The average person who gets symptomatic, which is about 20% of the people, even under 50, end up losing basically six weeks of their life. And we do not know, most of them have some long-term consequences. And there's some people who have had COVID back in March who are still suffering from symptoms from it who are under 50. So you really have to look at morbidity. The third point I'd like to make is the point about masks and economic recovery. You want to mm. see, feels comfortable things. We have found through many, many studies and looking at various countries that have done this, that if you just not, ma if you mandate, actually make it that punishable by law, that you have to wear a mask and you do only that, you can cut down transmission to an R value much less than one. And you can basically uh, then do testing and tracing to eliminate it from your community. So, I, so the three points again, morbidity is more, is as important as mortality. Uh, there are many young people who are suffering tremendously from this and dying and uh, masks will be the only way for a vaccine to get the economy going. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. I'm moving, going to move swiftly on to Jenny. I very much agreed with the tenor of what Norman was arguing because you can really see at this point in time, people I think are aware that you can't go back to what existed before. But there, there is very, very little positive being put forward um, you know in terms of what does need to be changed what sort of things can be tackled now on the economic front certainly i think there's there seems to be much more openness and many more people talking about you know the needs to sort of improve you know sort of procurement um you know within the country to improve um, productivity and so forth and so on. But one thing I think, just as an example of the sort of um, debates that are needed and really the um, ideas that have to be put forward, I would argue, for example, is the NHS. Now, I would hold the NHS actually responsible for a great deal of the problems, you know, that face the country. It was underprepared, the bureaucracy really got in the way, the bureaucracy was responsible for the edict that no one would have um, routine treatment. That was all frozen. Um, it was responsible, you know, in, in terms of, of, of the public health system for completely underestimating, you know, what was required in a pandemic. And 
the competition between the NHS and social care ensured, as it has been going on for quite a long time, that people are discharged from the NHS precisely because they aren't beds and they're taken back into, into care homes. Now that's been going on for some time, but of course it was crucially important you know, in the pandemic. The problem I see is that these arguments can be put forward, but this, there is such reluctance to criticizing the NHS. There is such reluctance to looking at alternatives for the NHS. So I'd be very, very interested in how you begin to sort of formulate and put forward the kinds of changes that are going to be needed in NHS, social care, and obviously in the economy. Yeah, uh, very interesting this evening. Um, I agreed particularly with a lot of the points that Jan very much earlier made. Um, but looking forward to how we're going to move on after this is over, um, I'm actually quite excited because we have uh, a lot of things that I didn't really know about particularly, like for instance this Zoom meeting. Um, much, much more convenient than driving several miles to go somewhere. And then um, you have people working at home. And on a very mundane note, I have to go to the tip next week, but I'm booking a slot. So instead of getting out at half past eight and queuing for an hour or more, I will go in, I will have my slot and I will come back out again. So actually, I think there are a lot of things that could change for the better after this. Obviously, we are going to have a lot of challenges. Um, I'm particularly bothered about the furlough issue uh, I, and an awful lot of the hysteria around it. I worked through all through lockdown with the international traveling public um, as part of a security team. So we were deemed to be essential workers. Uh, I'm 61. I have mild high blood pressure. It's not a problem, really. But, um, you know, I, I wasn't laid off. I wasn't furloughed. Um, I was kept on because I have certain skills that I can do. And we covered a lot of other people's jobs. Uh, we carried on. Uh, it was a bit of a lonely time, but uh, we cracked on with it. And it was hard work. Um, lots of people were travelling internationally, surprisingly. Not as many as usual, but quite a few. So I'm a little bit alarmed at the number of people who are saying it's not OK to go back to work. I'm saying go back to work. The rest of us are not getting anything extra for working all the way through it and people should be getting back as normal. I, I fully agree with Claire on that and that's all I have to say on the subject. Thank you very much. Great, thanks Pam. Um, the, us all getting back to work is definitely something we can we can get behind. I'll, head to, I'll hand over to Paul, then I'm going to take Claire, then we'll get the um, uh, We'll get the panel in quickly if they can. Uh, so Paul, I don't know if you want to start your video, Paul Butterworth, um, but hopefully We'll better see you, if not just far away. No, oh, they'll, they'll just talk anyway. It's, it's just started raining where I am. I'm sat outside, so maybe better from from not on video. So I, I work for um, uh, an NHS IT organisation, and a couple of points I wanted to make. Firstly, I agree very much with with Norman that it, that it is true that um, the uh, the pandemic focused a lot of minds and, and cut across a lot of. Um, uh, of bureaucracy to uh, to implement uh, a lot of um, much needed IT support for healthcare, uh, and so and, and that will be with us uh, on the other side of this pandemic. However, I think it's also true that um, over the uh, as, um, as over the past couple of months, that the the, the kind of people and organisations in the NHS that um, that perhaps are, are do have a more noise than signal for, or, or than value of have come back into into play and, and that that kind of initial uh, wave of <coughs> delivery focus has um uh, has, uh, has has become gone gone back to normal in, in lots of ways as well albeit that the, the ratchet has moved a bit um also um the, my, my main point is that I, i'm kind of concerned that so in my organization the our executive leadership of uh, currently planning on um, on a change from uh, the default position of being in the office uh, to being working at home 
and that's you know, for very understandable reasons. There's a perfect storm of, firstly, that there's a cost that, that they don't spend money on um, on office accommodation, um, but also staff surveys have, have said that uh, that firstly people are um, well, people are scared. Uh, they're still very scared of going out. I don't think we should underestimate the amount of fear that there is. It's, it's going to be very hard to, to remove and that uh, it doesn't mask help at all. Uh, and um, and also that you know that it's very convenient for people, isn't it, to um, to be able to uh, pick their kids up from school when when, when they're actually at school or, or in the, you know, uh, hang around in their pajamas and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, I'm really bothered about it. And it's, um, but it's very hard to put your finger on in terms of the yeah, actual evidence of is this a good thing or a bad thing? Um, because it, it feels quite subtle as to what we're missing. Mm. But I feel that, that we are missing something, even though over the past few months, I, I know I've, you know, I've built up Zoom relationships with people that I've never met and, uh, and we kind of you know, talk to each other, how are the kids and what you're doing at the weekend and all that kind of stuff. But something is missing, um, and, and I'm really concerned that the, the new normal will be much more atomized uh, in, in this kind of way because of because working at home, not interacting, uh, will, will be normal. Yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah, I definitely think it's worth trying to put our finger on exactly what, if anything, is missed about working remote, and why are so many people so reticent to return to work. It's just a, isn't just a thing about governance, it's, it's something we noticed speaking to people generally. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to Claire, then the panel are going to come in, um, and then we will try and get the rest of the hands. So, Claire. Uh, thanks. So, really uh, good discussion and, and fascinating introductions. Actually, I want to pick up a little bit on what both Paul and Pam, the two people who spoke before me, have said, because um, I agree that uh, what Norman said about the fact that nothing is set in stone and nothing, nothing is fated and in many ways we have choices now. But when he says we don't want the old normal or there's no going back, I am anxious because when people say that often, it's as an apology for getting rid of a lot of things that I think are positive. Now, Pam has made the point, you know, you can discover some conveniences from lockdown. Yeah, these Zoom meetings being one of them and the fact we can have an international discussion, which we couldn't have if this meeting was happening in London or Manchester or Salford or anywhere else. Uh, people have been able to come from all around the country and all around the world to it. But on the other hand, um, I don't like this idea that we end up uh, making excuses for the fact that we actually are no longer prepared to socialise with each other and spend time with each other, because I do think it's driven as much by fear. And when Paul asks what's happened, and if I have to listen to anyone else telling me how important it is that we don't, we can, we can all work from home and you know, Pam wasn't able to work from home because she was doing a practical job and millions haven't been able to. But those of us who do work in offices and so on, when they say, well, what, why do you need to go into the office? It basically essentially says that our, in, our interactivity between each other, the informal conversations that happen when we meet each other, the whole basis on which we as human beings are creative and work together, you know, is no long, it can just be dispensed with. And it's that kind of informal realm that I think is getting lost. You know, when I say that we should have more sociability, it doesn't mean I just want us to go to the pub, but there's actually nothing wrong with going to the pub, right? It's actually quite good to be able to meet and relax and chat and think out loud. But actually some of that happens in terms of how we solve problems as well and how we go about what Ben talked about, which is really throwing ourselves back into the economy. So when Claire Gerarda makes the point that you know, we should go back to normal. People say what she means and what I think is positive is that we are confident enough to go to work, send our kids to school. And the reality is, is that the new normal is often posited as living in a fearful state and frightened of each other. So one of, one of the things that, that, that I wanted to kind of ask was in terms of how to get out of this though, is how to have this conversation. And we're, we at the Academy of Ideas are trying to do it this way tonight and we've got this debate on. But one thing that Rebecca said that really, really struck me as being true is when she made the point that, you know, she can't stand the way libertarians have reacted to, to the face mask issue. And what I would say is, is that, that, that in a way she's right, is that a discussion about face masks has become polarised, hysterical, vicious, like a culture war. Somebody says, 
I should wear one. And somebody says, uh, uh, you know, you, you know, you wuss, you don't dare go out. What are you frightened of? Somebody says, I definitely am not going to wear one uh, because it's an imposition on me and, and treat it as though it's the greatest attack on civil liberties ever known to man. And it feels as though we're never having a serious conversation about it. When, when Anne Elizabeth talks about her international perspective, which is really useful to know, one of the things is that we are beginning to see all sorts of stories from around the world. And there is no yes or no correct answer on face masks. But you'd think that it was an absolutely definitive yes or no response to it. So what I think is missing is precisely that we're not talking enough, is that we are actually in a situation where we are atomized and fearful. And that's distorting our public debate, even about how we get out of the lockdown, how we get out of uh, the situation we're in. And as much as I'd like to be positive, I do think that unless we start to socialize with each other, to talk to each other, to meet each other, to be frank and open with each other, actually the outcome of this will not be positive. There's a terrible economic Armageddon on the on the horizon, but of course I think that humans can solve that, we can get over it. But what we won't be able to do is to get over it if we're fearful and if the fear takes the form of us actually being frightened of each other and passing a virus onto each other. And the only reason I'm worried about face masks is I think that it symbolizes that we fear each other. And even though everybody says they're only wearing them so that they can protect somebody else, I think even the fact that since they've been announced as mandatory, that people have actually descended into this kind of terrible tribal shouting at each other and become frightened again by the virus, which is in, which is in decline, would indicate that it's a kind of more psychological problem we're facing. And we have to be honest about the problems we solve rather than just being optimistic for the sake of it. Great. Thanks for that, uh, Claire. Uh, so I want to uh, get back over to the panel. Um, ben, if I can uh, come over to you just for some reactions in sort of the way we've been running a lot of these lockdowns. Based, we'll try and have a uh, thought from the panel, everyone in the panel by nine o'clock, and then those of us who are happy to carry on will stay on. But obviously, as panellists, we value your time. And if you want to drop out after that, then uh, more power to you. But we'll carry on afterwards. But Ben, any thoughts? Yeah, I just want to make one observation, developing really what Claire said. You know, the lockdown and the ability to put a social safety net around the populace whilst in lockdown is a privilege of the first world. A lot of third world and developing countries have, have done it, and I think they're going to have uh, even worse economic uh, outcomes than we will. Um, during our own lockdown, the privilege of working from home was for the better off in our community. The less privileged and the essential workers had to go out, and they went out without... I can't say without care for their own health, but they went out and they fulfilled their civic duty and, um, you know, did what was necessary in order to keep the economy going. Stack shelves, um, men robes, uh, you know, whatever it was. And I think we all now, as the elite, and I've looked at all the rooms um, as backdrops to everyone on this chat, we are the elite, whether or not we like to admit it. Um, we, the elite, have a civic duty to get back to work and now get the economy going. We can't just sit at home and create some kind of new utopia that suits um, the elite, but you know, let all, the, um, let all the essential workers and those who are less fortunate than ourselves go out and take the risks. You know, unless we lead from the front, unless we get the economy going, unless we're prepared to fill up, fulfill our civic duty, then I think that, um, you know, I think we're failing. Great, thanks for that, Ben. Um, Rebecca, uh, over to you. Thanks, two, two, two quick points. Um, first, um, in response to Alan's point about looking past um, mortality, I mean, I've got to say, it does strike me quite often that it's not really likely to kill me. It's not really a very cheering standard. It's not usually something which uses like a kind of good baseline when we're assessing risk. Um, and beyond that, it is a really nasty disease. It's nasty if it kills you, if you're going to effectively drown alone surrounded by people by hazmat suits in ICU. Yeah, maybe that's only likely to happen to a certain small percentage of the population, but it's also really nasty if you get mild symptoms. I know people who've had mild symptoms and they're still suffering months onwards. And as Alan also pointed out, we don't know anything about the long-term consequences of that. But I'd also add that it's also like, it's really nasty if you're lucky in the sense that you get no symptoms. It's, it's nasty in that sense, because then you run the risk of passing it on to other people without knowing that you've done so. 
and that's harmful not only to them but also to you i i, I kind of worry particularly about children who maybe pass it on to their granny by by mistake there's this story about you know, john rawls accidentally passing you know disease he had onto his brother and his brother died and he never got over it. i mean this is just it's it, it is a mental anguish here i really genuinely think shouldn't be understated so yes i think obviously we need to think about trade-offs yes we need to try to ensure that you know the state doesn't use this opportunity to act illegitimately and restrict our freedom in, in illegitimate ways. But I genuinely don't understand why people would want to underplay the severity of catching this disease, and particularly of suffering the symptoms and, and of dying from this disease, or indeed the need to quell the spread of this disease, exactly so that we can go back to doing the things that we value that we currently can't. And then, sorry, just final point, and I, I will possibly use Jacob's opportunity to drop off at nine o'clock so I haven't eaten anything today and I've just drunk three glasses of wine which is probably not a great idea um but I just wanted to um reflect for reflect um, just engage with what Claire said um about my point about being disappointed by by libertarians and Claire will know this but you may not maybe I maybe I didn't make this explicit enough the reason I'm depressed by libertarians is because I am a libertarian and my point is really that I'm the kind of libertarian who's into you know decentralized decision making um, wants to hold the state to account, hates state manipulation, but I have endless time for my fellow citizens making mistakes. I believe in reasoned, good, rational debate, not hating each other because of kind of polarized, silly divides over things that we haven't got full information about. And that's, I've got to say, that's, that's, that's genuinely why I'm depressed by this. And um, part of the problem is that the state has indeed suppressed the good information, and that's why I'm angry with the state. And I I know some of you are happy to forgive the state for the mistakes it's made, like you know, releasing COVID patients into care homes. Personally, I'm not. Those people need to be held to account, and I won't be happy until they are. That's I'm much more pissed off about that than people getting, you know, frustrated about a little bit of paper over your face and stuff. Thanks. Great, thanks for that, um, Rebecca. We're, we won't hold it against you at all. We're, we will know that if we're in the pub, of course, someone could pass you a packet of port scratchings. But um, uh, if thanks. only, if only, Jacob. And I, I, yeah, Jacob goes to the pub. I may go to the pub after this as well, because I too haven't eaten. Right, the first thing is, as much as I respect Rebecca, we've got to get facts right. Throughout this, and I've tried to put it in the chat box, people have been giving inaccurate figures and inaccurate comments, and we have to get them right, because this is what's perpetuating fit. Patients were not discharged to care homes. The reason why we had such morbidity and mortality in care homes is because we underpaid care home workers, peripatetic workers, zero hour contracts who went from one place to another and we took their PPE away from them and gave them to the hospitals. Okay, so we created the perfect environment. So we have to get that right. With respect, and somebody's put it on the chat, we just have to get used to it. We are going to be living with COVID forever. We still have plague plague. The reason why we're not het up about plague is it doesn't happen in this country. It happens far, far, far away. And one could argue the reason we're all really concerned about COVID is because it's with us here. The fact that malaria and death from diarrhea and all the other things aren't with us here is we've ignored them. So I think we have to be absolutely clear. Diseases have always been with us. We are not going to get rid of COVID even with a vaccine. The people that have suffered most during COVID are care workers, security guards and cleaners, because as many people have said, they're the ones that can't do their job remotely. The middle class, such as me, who can work in a nice big flat, uh, you know, are, are absolutely fine. And this disease is affecting our deprived populations, our BAME populations, our young people and our children. And the sooner we get our country back to normal or some sort of normality, washing our hands, I'd even accept a mask if we can start opening our shops, our restaurants, our theatres, our cinemas, and start to, 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 to actually realise that the economy is going to have far more impact on our, on our, on our health than, than uh, COVID ever is. So I too am going over to... Uh, eat something because I too am an exa uh, absolutely exhausted because I worked uh, as many of you have for the last 120 days trying to get things uh, keep things going but I would just like to thank all the fabulous comments that I've seen uh, in the chat box and all the ones that people have said so thank you very much. Great thanks for that Claire. Um, I'll pass over to Anne Elizabeth. Uh, well some some of what I plan to say has been addressed but I, I was listening to to Claire and I thought that she was making a very strong point about the uh, psychological effects. And that would be one reason to try and balance um, uh, the, uh, the need to protect others and the need not to go completely crazy because 
uh, I think there will be studies for uh, years on, on the psychological, uh, on the psychological effect of, of uh, lockdown. Um, we are human beings, we're gregarious beings, uh, we need to be together to build something, uh, and that's something that's been proven. In my case, I, like everybody on, on the panel, I have a nice flat in Paris, I'm used to writing from home, uh, my, my work didn't essentially change, and yet I became completely bonkers. And, and that was really something quite scary, because I told myself, I'm going to swing that, not difficult, and I could not live without seeing people. I was terrified, I had nightmares, I could not sleep. Uh, I started, I didn't mention them to people because every, everyone's ashamed of having that kind of, of sort of uh, weakness, it's seen as weakness. And as I was talking with more and more friends, as I was using social media, Facebook and other things, I realized that almost all my friends had this, that went through the same thing. I was unable to write, I let down editors, other people were in the same situation and we could realize that there was this feeling of society falling off. And if we cannot rebuild society because we're sort of too careful, I can see, I'm, I'm, I'm not an extremist one side or the other, but I think uh, the, uh, the togetherness of a country is something huge and that has proven it and we were about to lose it. And I suspect in some, some ways that what's happening right now in America is because they have lost it. Great, thanks, Anna Elizabeth. I'm going to hand over to Norman. Then, as I say, like people can drop off if they want, but there are a lot of people who still want to speak, and I'm I'm very happy to keep the conversation going. But Norman, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Um, well, uh, let me, I'll just relate a little bit about my experience I've had in Italy um, since I've, I've arrived here, just after it opened up on the 15th of of, of June. Um, we escaped the UK. We didn't build, we didn't dig a tunnel, but we, we almost did. But we escaped and we got here and it was totally weird because everybody was wearing masks in public places, in supermarkets. When you walked into a restaurant, you had to have a mask on, but then when you were in there, you could take it off, etc. And a number of things uh, struck us. Firstly, a lot of people were totally cynical about it. Um, didn't think it was doing anything, but they were going along with it because, as someone said, it meant that they could go to a restaurant. It meant that um, they could interact in the ways that, you know, because in Italy there was a, was a very severe lockdown. You couldn't leave your home. Um, you, 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 you couldn't go more than 100 meters away from your home. And there were police patrolling the streets and people being fined if they, so it was a real relief for people to do that. We also heard the same argument that some people have mentioned that um, they didn't wear it because they thought it was gonna, uh, protect anybody, but they thought that other people uh, were fearful of it and therefore they did it out of respect, a kind of etiquette to do that. And all this kind of indicated to me was that, and particularly some of the friends we have here, ones who own restaurants, they were totally cynical about it. They were going through the rituals. They had the temperature thing that they had gave to everybody, which they didn't really use when you came into the restaurant. They had all the, the gels and, and masks and all of that stuff. By the end of the evening, when everybody was a little bit drunk, they would go around taking everybody's temperature and you know, making jokes about it. The whole thing was a ritual. And what it indicated to me, and, and this is really to, 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 to slightly counter something that Claire's saying, um, I, we shouldn't read too much into this because while people are going along with it and, I, yeah, and, and there has been some reaction to it, people are actually exercising their moral autonomy. They are doing what's necessary in order to be sociable again. And that's the interesting thing for me. So it's not that people have lost the art of sociability. In fact, what we discovered in not only being in Lombardy, but when we went to Liguria last week, they say when you get into a restaurant, actually people are talking to each other a lot more than they ever did before. You're having conversations with people who are distanced from you and you're asking you where you're from and, and everybody's, everybody's interacting in ways that I've not seen before in Italy. So it's quite interesting that while we have this ritual going on, we shouldn't read too much into that, that you know, the psychological problems of all of this, I think, I think are being exaggerated. The point that I'm really trying to get at, and I don't think I'm being falsely optimistic or for the sake of it, I think the, 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 the point I'm really trying to make is that we have to think about the choices and the framework of what those choices are for the future. And I think it's quite important for us to not just accept 
the narrative as it's been handed down to us, as if this is a tablet of stone, but that this is all uh, um, amendable. That, you know, the crisis that we've gone through is a man-made crisis. Uh, you know, COVID-19 has no volition. It has no will of its own. It's, a, it's an accident of evolution. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's based in nature, but it's not a natural disaster. This disaster was created by men. By, by, by society, and society can therefore undo it. And my point really is to stress that we do need to look at the positives. Uh, perhaps I'm um, naively clinging on to um, slender threads, but that's what we've got. The, 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 the fact is that sociability is still there. It's being mediated by fear and uncertainty, but people are learning to deal with that. And we now got to move on and not concentrate upon that, but look about, look forward to, to what we do have in common and what the real needs are going to be going forward, particularly addressing the economic problems that we're, we're going to suffer. Great. Th thanks a lot for that, Norman. This is, it's important to try and capture a bit of a spirit of, of optimism, even if once we're even well taken advantage of what we know is, is going on. Um, as I said, I'll let those who want to drop out, drop out. If you're dropping out from the audience, make sure you head to academyofideas.org.uk slash donate before you do. Um, but I'll, I'll keep things going. Well, we'll obviously th well, I'm offering thanks to the panelists. Anyone needs to drop out, please feel free. We really appreciate your time. But I'm, I'm going to turn over to Hillary now because um, we'll, we'll keep going for the people who've got their hands up. Hillary, go. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so uh, just as a little uh, introductory point, I think people just need to be really careful about using this term return to work because a lot of people have been working from home very hard. Uh, you know, a lot of people I know. Um, and, and there's a difference between going back to work and going back to the office. Uh, and I just think we, it, it's just a bit of a, it's quite important to get that right. Um, on the things that people have said about uh, the, the coming um, uh, really severe economic problems, you know, that they're happening already. I don't think people should be thinking that they're not happening. Rolls-Royce is now shutting everything in the UK apart from Derby. Um, employers are counting back from the end of furlough and saying we're opening redundancy um, consultations now. And that is happening up and down the country. Hundreds of thousands of workers are now uh, under uh, uh, fear of redundancy. So, you know, this is not something to come. It, it, it's happening already. The thing I just wanted to disagree with in terms of what some people have said, and particularly when Ben was talking about the crisis of confidence that is sparked by government shilly-shallying about not knowing what they were doing. I think, I mean, I, I would locate the real issues that we've got a lot further back. I don't think they are the kind of thing that's been caused by COVID or, or the current situation. So, you know, we have moved from a, from a a society that understands risk as a kind of probabilistic risk that you can manage and that is subject to human agency and that can be uh, measured to that kind of possibilistic risk which is just a kind of uh, conceptual thing it's always there and when you do when you make that shift you are you do move to kind of worst case scenario planning and and what worries me in terms of you know i i would like to believe what what uh, you know the kind of optimistic spin uh, uh, on this but I, I do think that whatever government does now the public are just caught in the headlights of that fear uh, of, of, of worst case scenario and I just don't know how you get them out I don't know how you get businesses to say yes let's accept the risk associated with with going back to offices um, and, and some of the comments have said you know how do we build something that helps people to get there and I just that's what I'm struggling with how do we do that yeah, it's a great question, a great challenge for us all. I'm pass over to Jeremy. Hi, yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to make um, three uh, brief points. The first one, I think, uh, just following on from what uh, Jenny was talking about when she made some really good points about the NHS. And I think um, the NHS has sort of elevated itself to the status of a kind of religion. Um, and uh, this was sort of exemplified when, right at the beginning, when all the testing was going on, they went out of their way to try and consolidate all the testing in a centralized location in Milton Keynes and refuse to accept any of the help from the many private uh, clinics that were out there. And I think many other mistakes that Jenny highlighted as well, but there seems to be a general assumption with the NHS that um, they have the uh, best system in the world and there's a, a kind of willful ignorance of, of um, any other systems in any other countries which seem to operate an awful lot better in many cases than uh, what the NHS does. So 
there seems a lack of ability to learn. My second point is um, regarding the economy. And I would say just in, in uh, to complement what Ben is saying about, of course, the economy is going into um, deep difficulties and problems, but there are some companies which are doing well and there are some glimmers of hope out there, um, not least of which in the Perspex manufacturing industry, which is doing quite well. Um, IT companies are all doing uh, pretty well, or most of them are doing pretty well. There's a huge demand out there. Um, and of course, supermarkets um, in general, they are doing pretty well. Um, so I think the important thing with the economy is it will only recover if we allow failure and if we allow change to take place rather than just concentrating on the old economy and trying to save jobs that in many cases are never going to come back, many of them. And we're plowing money into the old jobs, whereas actually some industry is going to grow and expand out of this. And then my final point is really about society. And I think a lot of, a lot of points have been made, some really great points from, uh, from the panel and from many people. Um, but I, I think that society is really struggling. Um, there's a huge amount of anger out there. I think this is shown when we see the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. We see young people willfully ignoring regulations and rules and uh, raves taking place. Um, and I, I do worry about um, sort of civil breakdown and things getting far worse as unemployment increases. We really haven't even begun to see uh, the great problems uh, that are going to uh, come along. So I, I would endorse um, the sentiment of, of many people that it really behoves all of us, those who can, to go out to work, to get back to the workplace and to start doing things so that we who are able to can help and assist society for those who are just unable or least able in society to look after themselves. Those are my points. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with Norman on the vaccine and on the uh, innovation and development. I think that's important. And to show you can just, you know, wipe away a lot of red tape very quickly and make great progress is, is good and example for others. And also, I'm quite happy to accept, obviously, as uh, Rebecca was saying, that it's a very nasty disease. And it's not something that you want to get. But as Claire Gerarda said, it's something we, we're going to have to learn to live with uh, in, in some ways. And how long do we close society down? And as Hillary has just said, we're in a situation where at the moment we get monthly missives from the government on gyms reopening, cricket balls, nail bars, and we don't have a discussion. As, I mean, people don't discuss with each other. People don't think they've got a role in reopening society. People are just sitting at home waiting for the thing to be declared over and then maybe in some form it'll start. Uh, and, and I think we have to initiate maybe ourselves a discussion with each other. Having just been across the country last week on empty trains through empty towns where basically people, they may be working at home, but everyone seems to be, and it's a generalization, everyone is at home unless they need to be somewhere else. That's the general situation in England. And it's how to change that. Maybe not into the old way, but that is the situation. And, I, 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 and, it, and it's not all a fraud or people playing at it and, and, and playing at wearing masks or whatever. It's, it's quite deep felt. I think when the government backed down on the schools um, back in May and June and said they didn't need to reopen, that was a real setback. And that showed when schools are open, to me, society is open. And I think they've backed down on schools in June. And I'm worried that they're going to back down on schools again in the UK in September. And I think that would be a terrible thing if, that, if schools didn't open right through the autumn in, into the winter. So I think that may be something where we can say, right, obviously a lot of people are working from home. It's not quite so straightforward going back into the office. But certainly with education, to say, let's get that back on the road. And we can have, then have a dialogue and a discussion about living with this terrible disease and getting society re reopened in different ways as we go forward. Great, thanks for that, uh, Jeff. You, you, you hit a few nails on the head there. Thanks a lot. I'm going to head over to Josephine, then she there I will take, and then maybe Norman will, will come back to sum things up for us a little. Um, I just, um, I really agree with Norman actually on the informal aspect of it. I'm um, sorry, it's very dark here suddenly. Um, I'm in the country, it must be something to do with that. Um, 
but I've been back at school. I was I was working um, in as um, looking after key workers. So I've been working since twenty of March, and I've been teaching year six in a bubble. Um, and the people who've come back to school have varied in their approaches. I've like opened everything up now, freedom. And then there's people who've been really really scared. But the thing that's really struck me through the whole process is how the informal has really kind of helped. And I, I think we're under mes underestimating the social. Um, I've had somebody who only looked after my children at lunchtime in a field because she was so scared. And yesterday she said, oh, they were playing football and they were tackling each other. And I kind of thought, oh, am I doing wrong? And I said, no, you're not. And so she's really relaxed. And I think um, through the informal, we are kind of really opening up in a way that it's not happening through the formal. Um, and my problem is that we have this very informal um, sense of people going, okay, actually, this is okay, isn't it? And we could maybe take a step closer, but then there's no leadership to say, yeah, it's okay. Let's keep going with that. And so it's a kind of really weird mishmash between those people who have come out and have been quite, I mean, I've been lucky because I've been, engaged in society for the whole time and i feel very relaxed as do most people who've been engaged in society as do the restaurant owners in italy with norman although i don't know why they would feel relaxed with norman um but it's that lack of leadership um that um i think is the problem we're ready for it but no one's going yeah that's okay to be to feel okay about it yeah i just want to ask a question and comment on this um idea of the golden age of problem solving and and how do we bring Norman's and uh, Ben's views of all of this together really it's almost like there's a there's a there's a pessimism and there's an optimism and how do we bring them together in the reality of all of this so if the crisis speeded up destruction of the old normal then where exactly is the fundamental rethink about what's next going on? And I think that's what everybody has confirmed, that there's a problem with the breakdown of social interaction and people coming together. So um, if that culture of distrust continues and grows, which I think is some of our fears, then where and how do people organise around the, act, the important stuff? You know, so th th there's such a lot to talk about and there's some individual things and, and individual businesses but where exactly is can, can we come together to talk about the big stuff we've had debt and bankruptcy and economic crisis we've had mass unemployment before in history but when i've looked at the data this looks absolutely huge so um you know how do we bring norman's kind of optimism and deal with ben's worries you know in our own despair how do we avoid a situation where we're just trying to predict the future rather than make the future um it, it, like if, if economically it's not an absolute given that this is going to be a total shit storm then then what can we do i suppose it sounds a bit desperate that doesn't it what can we do no, it's, it's a, a brilliant call to arms in terms of, uh, as you say, making the future, not just predicting it. If I can chuck in my two cents, because I'm going to abuse the power of chair. I think, and, and I know well that Norman will make some great points in terms of the positive or any, or half the necessity of seizing some of the positives rather than sort of just being Pollyanna-ish. It's that I, I, one of the things that really worries me is that n we're not quite yet to grips with the degree to which this isn't like something that is mandated by government. This is something that everyone feels. People either like being at home because perhaps they prefer spending lots of time with their family because they have to commute so long because our country is set up in such a ridiculous way that people have to commute halfway across the country to just get to their workplaces. Or they don't like their job very much because sitting in a soulless cubicle office or whatever is, is pretty horrible. Or on the other hand, that people sort of as, like their, their conditions at work are so terrible that people don't really want to go out either. And then perhaps worst of all, that there is a genuine and pervasive climate that doesn't, lots of people don't see the value, like what, what is lost by being in public? People can't answer that question anymore. And so whilst I get that we're gonna to have to try and grasp some of the possibilities, that's the, as ever the only way out. But we do, I think for me, I'm just constantly forcing myself to look at the evidence or look at what is being revealed by this situation about 
some of the sort of basic absence of commitments to certain values that were once taken to be very straightforward, the essential to civilization as we knew it. And that now people don't necessarily have the will to argue for or even really know what they mean. And until I think we can get our heads around that and begin to argue for some of that stuff again, I, I don't quite see how we're even going to better go on to grasp some of the possibilities. But that's just me. I'm going to pass over to Norman to round things out for us. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I don't think I'm, I'm going to be able to square the circle, I'm afraid, um, because I think that, well, just to, to, to if, 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 if you had to come with me to a restaurant in Italy, I think you would understand why people were sociable. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, the, the point, the point um, I think the point that people are raising, I think particularly what Jacob just raised um, about the, you know, the reluctance to go back to work, the people at home, uh, the, the points that Jeff raised uh, about the passivity, about the fear and all of that, I think this is real. I mean, it's not, uh, I'm not dis 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 dismissing that. I think we do need to understand that um, and understand what, what's, what's behind it. But, but I think um, we, we know from our own experience that in all circumstances that the human spirit is such that uh, necessity, the need for sociability um, will come through in the end. This is, this, is, this is what's been so revealing to me about being in Italy. I mean, it has been so, it was so alien to me to have to put on a mask and, and go through that experience of not being able to see someone's mouth. And you realize how important such a fundamental thing that is to, to human communication and to, human, to, to, to being human um, and just how, how absolutely awful it is. But the point, the point is that, you know, even under fascism, under the Nazis, people found ways of organizing. People, you know, still managed to get on with things and 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 resisted and 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 things threw uh, were thrown up because that's what human beings do. And you know, I'm I'm maybe I'm the naive optimist in in in, in the Zoom in the Zoom Zoomiverse, but um, it strikes me that people are, whether they like it or not, let's put it this way, they are going to have to confront this problem. They are going to, you know, there, there is a real problem with the fact that people don't want to go back to work, uh, notwithstanding the points that uh, uh, Hillary made about people have been working, but, you know, going back to the office and all of that. Um, I think that there, 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 there is a real problem. I mean, that, there's a real social problem there, um, you know, that, 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 that we are going to have to deal with because you, you cannot run a society on that basis, a, a modern economy, you just can't do that. But at the same time, there's also a rational element to all of that. You know, the fear on the one hand, but also on the other that I think someone made the point that people, you know, thinking, looking at their life and looking at their jobs and thinking, well, it's a pretty shitty job I've got. And, you know, if I'm being paid to stay at home, I'd rather stay at home to spend time with the kids, not waste all that time on an on a, a overcrowded tr transport um, and just have more of a, a life. And why not whilst uh, things were okay when with the furlough and, and all of that? But that's going to end. And the harsh reality of, of our society is that people are going to be confronted by this reality and, and something's going to have to be done. I think at the, at the end of the day, um, the solution to this, there's no magic wand. How, you know, Ben's pessimism about the economy, I'm very pessimistic about the economy, but I'm also optimistic about the ability of people to find a way through this, um, mainly because we will not have an alternative. You will, we will not be able to sit back like this. Society just cannot function like that. And I think the fact that we're having this discussion this evening is an indication of the fact, the fact that you know, there, there were so many people on this, on, on this discussion. People are looking for answers, are looking to, 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 for alternatives. And it's through this that it's, in fact, it's, if anything, it's the question of, of, of giving a lead, of, 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 of showing that you know, there are people out there that really want to discuss this, they really do want to understand what is going on, what the limits might be. And I am, all I've tried to do this evening is to highlight some positive things um, 
because we are mired in this, this, we can easily just fall into this pessimism of just saying that everything is just falling apart, that, you know, we're, we're, this is life, we're going to have to live like this for the rest of our lives. Well, I don't, I don't believe we do. I mean, we can already see in places like Lombardy, which let's face it, was where the whole shift from the strategy that the government had had, which was about mitigation, then turned into, you know, let's just stop the whole thing because of what happened um, in Lombardy. When I look at Lombardy now, it is almost normal. Apart from the fact that there is this ritual of the face masks, life here is very much the same as it was before the, the crisis when I was here last year. And people are getting on with it because that's what people do. I think what we've got to do is to try and give shape to that sentiment, to that aspiration in a way that, 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 that can go beyond just simply accepting uh, everything as it is, or just that, that passivity is the, is the solution. I think it is about giving a lead in this setting an example um, that others will then follow because they will see that their concerns or their worries or their fears are unfounded, that we can, we can go beyond uh, just simply surviving COVID. Great, Norman, thanks so much for that. And thanks for ending on that note. Um, thanks to you. Thanks to everyone who's joined us. I will say that, of course, at the Academy of Ideas, we're going to try and take a, a leading role in returning or setting the example. And we don't have exact things to share yet, but rest assured, we're going to be organising the Battle of Ideas for as soon as we can feasibly do it. We're going to co we're committed to holding public events in person, meeting up with other people as soon as we feasibly can. Um, and as I've stressed a little bit throughout the evening, part of that requires some of your support. So I'll make another plug to, uh, to go heading to academyofideas.org.uk slash donate. But equally, it's not going to happen and couldn't have happened without the sort of contributions that we've had this evening, both from the panel and also from everyone that's joined us tonight. So in, every, in everyone's small little contribution, I think we are making a little bit of progress in uh, returning to the public sphere as much as we can. So that's all from me. Um, I'll leave things open and running just for a little bit, but otherwise, um, cheers. Let's hopefully see each other in person in the public sphere as, as soon as possible. Thanks a lot, guys. Arrivederci.